Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think. So last week we had a look at hydrogen storage and I think it's fair to say it's been a pretty interesting week since then. More than 80,000 people watched that video and 6,000 new subscribers have joined the channel just in the last seven days, which is absolutely phenomenal and a massive thank you to all of you. There's obviously some strength of feeling out there on both sides of the hydrogen debate and that came through loud and clear in your comments last week. There was quite a bit of feedback suggesting that there wasn't enough emphasis in last week's programme on the inherent inefficiencies of the hydrogen conversion process and that's a perfectly reasonable observation. In fact it's something we looked at in the video that we did last September which you can click and have a look at up there. But in the meantime here's a quick summary. Water electrolysis loses about 30% of the energy that's put into the reaction. There's a slightly more efficient version called proton exchange membrane electrolysis which improves the output from 70 to 80 percent but this is still a lot less efficient than the 99 percent charging efficiency of a lithium-ion battery. Freezing hydrogen to about 20 degrees above absolute zero loses around 40 percent of the available energy whereas pressurization loses about 13 percent so pressurization tends to be the more common option. Transporting the fuel can cost anything between 10% and 40% of the energy depending on the transport method and the distance of travel. And then you've got energy losses inside the fuel cell. Modern hydrogen fuel cells are about 60% efficient. The other 40% is mostly heat loss. Taking everything into account, you get an overall efficiency for lithium ion vehicle batteries of about 75% compared to 35% for hydrogen fuel cells, which equates to a cost per mile for hydrogen fuel cell vehicles that's about eight times higher than the cost of lithium ion battery powered vehicles. So for small personal vehicles, it's fair to say the hydrogen has got an uphill battle in the marketplace. But by the way, let's not forget that internal combustion engines can only operate at about 20 to 30% efficiency because the majority of their energy is lost to heat. So in any comparison, ICE engines come out as the poor relation. Some of you also felt that hydrogen was just a backdoor way of allowing the fossil fuel producers to continue producing fossil fuels. After all, as we mentioned last week, the industrial process of steam reforming produces hydrogen by splitting natural gas, otherwise known as methane or methane in the United States, a process which releases CO2. And the concept of adding hydrogen to existing methane natural gas pipelines as a kind of bridging fuel to ease down natural gas production will, some say, also allow the fossil fuel companies to fudge their figures and make it look like they're doing a much better job than they really are. And one or two of you over there in the United States also suggested that any grid level implementation of hydrogen is just shifting the emphasis from one monopolistic power producer to another, allowing the shadowy money men to maintain their grip on power and still control the prices that you and I pay for our energy. They're all valid points that deserve the benefit of full debate, which is probably something that's outside the scope of a single programme. But as with every single other disruptive technology that human beings have ever invented, from the telegraph and the internal combustion engine in the 19th century to renewable energies and the internet today, there will always be a body of opinion that instinctively looks for reasons not to continue with its development. And that's no bad thing in a way, it keeps the developers on their toes and it probably does occasionally weed out the really wacky ideas from the mix. In one sense, here in Europe, and particularly in continental Europe, that fear of monopolistic centralised control that I spoke about a moment ago is just as prevalent as it is over there in the United States. Over here though, the anxiety is all about Europe's heavy reliance on Russian methane gas. European governments feel an acute sense of vulnerability to the vagaries of Mr Putin's regime, as was so graphically demonstrated when Russia's gas giant Gazprom turned off Ukraine's gas supply in the middle of the harsh 2018 winter. Here in the UK, our government policy is guided by our very own Climate Change Committee, or CCC. They're the people who earlier this year recommended a pathway by which the UK could reach net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Part of that pathway would see the UK government pushing ahead with the development of hydrogen. The committee's report made these summary observations. Hydrogen is a credible option to help decarbonise the UK energy system, but its role depends on early government commitment and improved support to develop the UK's industrial capability. Hydrogen can make an important contribution to long-term decarbonisation if combined with greater energy efficiency, cheap low-carbon power generation, 
electrified transport and new hybrid heat pump systems which have been successfully trialled in the UK. Hydrogen could replace natural gas in parts of the energy system where electrification is not feasible or is prohibitively expensive, for example in providing heat on cold winter days, industrial heat processes and backup power generation. But they also point out hydrogen is not a silver bullet solution. There's clearly a great many potential opportunities being pursued and developed with hydrogen and again far too many for a single programme so in today's video we're just going to focus on the part of that climate change committee report that talked about using hydrogen as part of a hybrid system to heat our homes. Heating homes, businesses and industry accounts for nearly half of all the energy use in the UK and a third of UK carbon emissions, so reductions in this sector will have a big influence on the UK's chances of hitting the 2050 target. The CCC reckoned the cheapest scenario for the UK's national heating in a low carbon world will be achieved by installing hydrogen boilers in conjunction with the electrification of heating, by which they mean a hybrid heating system. So what exactly is a hybrid heating system? Well, it's a system that combines a heat pump outside the house with some sort of boiler inside the house. There's two types of heat pump, air source heat pumps or ground source heat pumps. According to this very useful report at possibly one of the world's most geekly titled websites, boilerguide.co.uk, a ground source heat pump extracts heat from underground. Pipes are buried in your garden either horizontally in loops or vertically downwards. A fluid passes through these pipes which extracts heat from the ground and transfers it to a heat exchanger. This heat exchanger heats water for your taps and central heating. An air source heat pump is a fan unit which is installed outside your home where it extracts heat from the air outside even in temperatures as low as minus 15 and again this heat is used to heat water for your taps and your central heating. The other half of the hybrid system is the kind of boiler that most of us are already used to. The boiler is at its most effective and cheapest to run in the cold winter months. A hybrid heating system will monitor the temperature outside and automatically choose the most energy efficient option. For example, when the temperature outside is 2 degrees Celsius or higher, the heat pump will heat your home and hot water using renewable energy so your boiler doesn't need to run. When the temperature drops, the system will intelligently switch to your boiler so as to maintain efficiency and keep energy costs to a minimum. In fact, the boiler could just use natural gas like the boilers that most of us have got in our homes now. But of course, that wouldn't really contribute to our net carbon zero targets, would it? It could instead be an all electric model. Electric combi boilers already exist. And if they get their power from renewable energy, either because you get your electricity from a green energy provider or you've got solar panels on your roof or perhaps even a combination of both, then an electric boiler is a very good low carbon alternative to our traditional gas boilers. In fact, so far in this scenario, we haven't mentioned hydrogen at all. So where does that fit in? Well, as a result of those climate change committee recommendations that we looked at earlier, Back in 2018, the UK Government Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, or BEIS, headed by Claire Perry, commissioned Fraser Nash Consultants to produce a full report on the potential for domestic hydrogen boilers, as well as hobs, ovens and fires. While the Climate Change Committee does accept that production and use of hydrogen is generally less efficient than electrification, they also point out that hydrogen is more readily storable than electricity at very large scale, which is why the UK and other European governments are quite keen to use it to replace natural gas and potentially oil in parts of the energy system where full electrification is very difficult or disruptive or very expensive. So how do hydrogen boilers work then? Well, that's a very good question because they're not actually commercially available just yet. That's where the report from the Fraser Nash Consultancy comes in. They looked at three likely options for development. Number one was new appliances developed specifically to run on hydrogen. Number two was the adaptation of existing natural gas appliances in situ to run on hydrogen. And number three was new dual fuel appliances that can switch from natural gas to hydrogen. And they've actually identified some fairly significant technical challenges that will need quite a lot of research and development to overcome. In very, very brief summary of their very large report, they made these final conclusions. 
Hydrogen has a significantly higher flame speed, greater flammability range, and is likely to burn at a higher temperature than natural gas. These characteristics present significant engineering challenges that particularly affect the burners in appliances. Specifically, there are concerns with light back, which is propagation of flames back through burners, higher NOx emissions, and the potential explosion of unburned gas. Yeah, they need to sort that one out. The report also talks about flame failure devices, and these things detect the presence of a flame and automatically switch the gas off if the flame goes out. Natural gas boilers use ionization sensors to detect combustion gases from the flames. But ionization sensors don't work with a hydrogen flame, so you need something else. Industrial processes use ultraviolet and infrared sensors. They're a good option, but they'll have to be redeveloped to reduce their size and cost. Other components like pipelines, gas valves and heat exchangers will need a certain amount of redevelopment to cope with the different combustion characteristics of hydrogen, but essentially the fundamental operating principles won't fundamentally change. Perhaps their most important piece of advice though is this. Development of 100% hydrogen domestic appliances will require government intervention. Initially, this requires target funding to close the innovation gap and develop the first generation of appliances. In other words, some central government finance paid for out of our taxes will have to be diverted from other funding programs into the research and development and quite possibly subsidization of these new technologies. The Climate Change Committee themselves even went as far as saying this. Depending on the development of hydrogen ready appliances and the cost premium over natural gas boilers, the government should consider mandating hydrogen-ready heating appliances by the mid-2020s, similar to the successful mandation of condensing boilers 20 years earlier. And that's a concept that might be more readily acceptable over here in Europe than it would be in some other societies around the world, not least in the United States. And then there's still the issue of how the hydrogen is produced in the first place. As this CCC infographic shows, it won't just be via water electrolysis, the intention is still to use steam reforming as well, but with the important addition of carbon capture and storage. Now that's a whole separate technology and debate that we've looked at a couple of times in previous programs, so I won't dwell on it here. Suffice to say that for various reasons, the jury is very much still out on whether carbon capture and storage is a viable option within the carbon reduction project. No doubt many of you will have a view on this subject and there have been some great debates in the discussion threads on the previous videos so please do feel free to dive in and leave your thoughts in the comments section below. We could go into loads more really technical detail on this one but in the interest of brevity and sanity I'll leave it there for this week. I have though left links to all the articles and technical papers that I used to research this programme so if you want to delve into the subject a bit more then scroll down past the description in the comments section and they'll all be there for you to click on. Please do give us a like and a share if you found the programme useful and informative. And most important of all, if you haven't already done so, please do subscribe to the channel to support the work that we do. 6,000 people in a week can't be wrong after all. And if you hit the little notification bell when you subscribe, then you'll be kept up to date whenever a new episode comes out. It is, of course, completely free to do that. And all you need to do is click on that link there. As always, thank you very much for watching. Have a great week. And remember, to just have a think. See you next week.